بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and friends I greet you all with the Islamic greetings of peace My name is Hamza Andreas Zorzis from Sapiens Institute and the main purpose of this video is to unpack some ideas concerning freedom of speech, freedom to insult, to unpack what's happening in France at the moment and to unpack and discuss the defamatory cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But before I do that, I want to remind you of two key important prophetic authentic teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one, Love for humanity what you love for yourself. Love for humanity what you love for yourself. Now the scholars speak about this, the classical scholars speak about this, and generally speaking, they say that Muslims must be committed to the well-being of others. This means we must want goodness for people and guidance for people. This is what loving for others mean. You want goodness for them, you want them to be in a state of well-being, and you want guidance for them. And we must act appropriately in order to achieve the well-being of humanity. The second authentic prophetic teaching is there is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. No harm. There is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. These are very important prophetic teachings and I thought I'd remind everyone of these profound teachings, these concise and profound teachings, especially in today's context. Now, I said I'm going to unpack some ideas concerning freedom of speech, freedom to insult, the defamatory cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and what's been happening in France. And I'm just going to summarize four main areas, and there's other things I'm going to be talking about as well, but these are the four main areas that I'm going to discuss. Area number one, I'm going to try and discuss the philosophy of freedom of speech, its inevitable implications in society, specifically secular society, the harm principle, and the competition of values. Area number two, I'm going to talk about the hypocrisy and double standards displayed by secular ideologues. Area number three, I'm going to talk about the importance of civility and how freedom to degrade and insult is not logically necessary to achieve the objectives of freedom of speech. And the final area, I'm going to talk about intellectual freedom, progress, and dialogue, and that these things are not threatened by being civil and by being ethical and by being averse to insults and degradation. And I'm going to try and show that the Islamic intellectual and spiritual tradition with its long history is an example of a cohesive ethical civilization. So let's go straight to the first point. There are claims made by some liberal and secular ideological extremists that the defamatory cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are about freedom of speech and freedom to insult. And they generally maintain that we must allow defamation, we must allow degradation, and we must allow gratuitous insult because it's all about preserving the right to express oneself, including liberty of thought. However, this is grossly misleading and it is simply not true. Why? Because there is no such thing as absolute freedom of speech. I repeat, there is no such thing as absolute freedom of speech. Every society on this planet has limitations and restrictions on speech. And these restrictions occur because of a competition of values. Now, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, David Van Mill, an academic, he highlights this point. He says, the first thing to note in any sensible discussion of freedom of speech is that it will have to be limited. Every society places some limits on the exercise of speech because it always takes place within a context of competing values, which we'll discuss in a moment. And there are many examples in law and public life that I want to bring to light in order to show you that there are restrictions on speech. Take France as an example. The French criminal code punishes outrage, grave insult, of the national anthem or tricolor flag. Now, think about the hypocrisy here. You have the secular and liberal ideologues claiming that the defamatory cartoons of the Prophet wasallam are about freedom of speech, and that includes freedom to insult. But when it comes to insulting the flag and the anthem, then it's, you know, you can't do that. 
you must be criminally punished. It was the outrage concerning these laws. Another example is the political cartoonist Maurice Sine. He worked for the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo for 20 years and he was fired in 2009. Why? Because he drew some cartoons. Cartoons mocking the relationship of the former French president Sarkozy's son with a wealthy Jewish woman. Another example is in law. A French court injunction banned a, uh, a Jesus-based clothing advert mimicking Da Vinci's Last Supper. A French judge ruled that the display was a gratuitous and aggressive act of intrusion on people's innermost beliefs. In 2005, Danish newspaper Jillens post and published caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but rejected the publications of cartoons mocking Jesus Alaihi Salam, upon whom be peace, because they would provoke an uproar. And there are many more other examples. Now, in many other countries, including France, there are defamation laws, product defamation laws, hate speech laws, libel laws, laws against the Holocaust denial, and so on and so forth. So, it must be made very clear that this has nothing to do with freedom of speech in an absolute sense. This doesn't even exist in academic discourse, generally speaking. It's, a, it's not a very robust idea. It's an incoherent idea. And the reason it's incoherent, because people appreciate that there are other values in society that are going to be used to put restrictions on speech. In a nutshell, there's no such thing as absolute freedom of speech. So the discussion is not about freedom of speech per se, but it's about other competing values. So there is a key question here. What other competing values will these ideologues consider in placing restrictions on speech? Clearly, as a result of what we've just discussed so far, clearly the dignity of minorities is not a value they want to consider. So from this perspective, the problem is not with Islam. The problem is with the French state-sanctioned secularism. That's the problem because it doesn't value its minorities. It doesn't want to dignify its citizens. It doesn't want to dignify its minorities. And it wants to use its power to selectively choose which minorities they're going to dignify more than other minorities, which is a huge problem. So the failure here is French secularism. It's state-backed secularism. The religion of, of, uh, of the French society from that perspective. Now, some may argue, and we have mentioned that absolute freedom is incoherent philosophically, and to be honest, generally speaking, there is a consensus that there is no such thing as absolute freedom of speech. But you have some liberal ideologues, right, that say, no, there must be no, there must be no restrictions at all. So some argue that any form of restrictions to freedom of speech can lead to tyranny and can lead to censorship. And this is why we must have no restrictions at all. But hold on a second. This is a false argument because the door swings both ways. If you have no restrictions at all, that may lead to anarchy. And the academic David Van Mill, he highlights this point really, really well. So he says, those who support the slippery slope argument tend to make the claim that the inevitable consequence of limiting speech is a slide into censorship and tyranny. It is worth noting, however, that the slippery slope argument can be used to make the opposite point. One could argue that we should not allow any removal of government interventions on speech or any other type of freedom, because once we do, we are on the slippery slope to anarchy. And he continues, it is possible that some limits on speech might, over time, lead to further restrictions, but they might not. And if they do, those limitations might also be justified. The main point is that once we abandon the incoherent position that there should be no limits on speech, we have to make controversial decisions about what can and cannot be expressed. This comes along with the territory of living together in communities. And this was taken from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Now, let's focus on the last statement here. This comes along with the territory of living together in communities. So given the double standards and hypocrisy of those in power in France, 
maybe they are they are showing a sign that they don't want Muslim minorities to be part of their community. This leads us to another important point, which is the consideration of important values. So I want you to think about values such as cooperation, civility, dialogue, and social cohesion. These are very important values that need to be considered. They need to be considered. Those in power, especially in France, in the West, in our communities, those who hold power in our communities at every level, they need to consider these values of cooperation, civility, dialogue, and social cohesion. And once you consider them, then you'll be able to make appropriate restrictions on speech that still facilitates the objectives of freedom of speech. And let me just remind you, this has nothing to do with freedom to insult, as some claim. Just remember, many insults and various forms of defamation are considered unlawful in France and other secular countries. So it's nothing to do with, oh, we have to be free to insult whatever we want, whoever we want. It just doesn't make sense based on what we've said so far. So this is why it is very clear that those in power, they selectively choose which insults and speech that offends is to be made unlawful. So this highlights that freedom to insult, to degrade and to defame is not an absolute right, which leads us to a very important point now. Classically, historically, freedom of speech was understood to be a means to achieve important virtues, such as truth, progress and accountability, specifically take into account those in power. British philosopher John Stuart Mill, he maintained that free speech fosters authenticity, genius, creativity, individuality, and human flourishing. However, there's something that we have to say here. There isn't a logical connection between freedom to insult and these virtues. The minute that we can show that insults can, in many cases, prevent these virtues from manifesting themselves is the minute you show that insults are not necessary for their manifestation. Here's a logical summary. Number one, to convince someone of the truth and to promote the truth in many circumstances requires good argumentation, persuasion and civility. Number two, insults in many contexts are a barrier to good argumentation, persuasion and civility. Number three, conclusion. Therefore, insults in many cases prevent the truth. Therefore, the objective or one of the objectives of freedom of speech is undermined. So it goes to show there is no logical necessary connection between freedom to insult and these virtues of truth, progress and accountability. So let's give you some more examples, applied examples. Take into consideration the famous scientist Stephen Hawking. Imagine that when he was alive, in wanting to prevent, to present rather, one of his theories, he started his presentation by insulting the audience, saying that they are stupid and that their mothers should have should have aborted them. Now, this uncivilized approach would not have facilitated scientific progress and the objective of communicating the truth of his theory. Another example, take political accountability. If someone wanted to take to account the Chinese government for the oppression of the Uyghurs and the person starts insulting Chinese culture and religious practices, well, it just wouldn't facilitate good accountability. Let's also ask, let's also ask, if a government continuously publishes propaganda that otherizes and dehumanizes a minority, are such expressions conducive to human flourishing? Given the link, brothers and sisters and friends, given the link between such propaganda and violence against minorities and even genocide, refer to Bosnia, refer to, refer to Nazi Germany, it clearly shows that such propaganda is not conducive to human flourishing. And this is something that J.S. Mill, John Stuart Mill articulated quite well with his harm principle. He argued that speech should be, should be restricted if it leads to harm. And Mill, he, he, he used the 19th century corn dealers as an example, and he argued that a mob should incur punishment if they express that corn dealers are starvers of the poor when assembled before the house of a corn dealer, because that could lead to inevitable harm. 
So it is important to note here that freedom of speech emerged as an idea to empower the weak to take to account the power of, 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 of the time. And this is very important to, to highlight, especially in the French context. So let me just repeat that. It is important to note that freedom of speech emerged as an idea to empower the weak to take to account the power of the time. Remember, it was the Catholic Church in Europe that was censoring and preventing intellectual progress, and many would argue it was a coercive power. Freedom of speech emerged to challenge the power structures of society. So really, what's happening in France is antithetical to the spirit and foundation of freedom of speech, because the French government is basically using its power in a selective way to degrade a minority, those who are weak. But it should be the other way, the other way around. The whole raison d'etre, using French, the whole reason of existence of freedom of speech was primarily for those who are weak to take to account those who have power. So it's quite telling that the French secularists, those in power, they want to use the so-called banner of freedom of speech to oppress and dehumanize a minority and their beliefs. What are they afraid of? Well, I know what they're afraid of. They're really afraid of the timeless, universal, compassionate values of Islam and the truth of the Islamic worldview, that God exists, that he's worthy of worship, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger. This is what they're afraid of. They're afraid of the truth. And they don't want to engage in intellectual dialogue or discussion. They want to degrade and to defame. So this leads to a very important point of being civil. So civility, brothers and sisters and friends, dictates that if one wants to have a society that has values of truth and progress and accountability, then one should contextualize their speech and utterances to ensure that these virtues are achieved. So what, does civil, what is civ being civil mean? It basically means that if you want truth, if you want accountability and you want progress, then when you express yourself, it must be contextualized to ensure that these virtues we've just mentioned are actually achieved. Which means and implies that they need to understand their target audience as much as possible. This, brothers and sisters and friends, is basic civility. Basic civility. What the French ideologues are trying to tell you is they don't want to be civilized. They hate civility. They hate civility. They want to take you back to the medieval ages. Now, this is a very important point, by the way. I do appreciate, however, that there is a gray area when it comes to insult and offense. The moment one expresses themselves, they have to risk offending others and risk being offended. However, there are obvious black and white scenarios. It is quite clear that the defamatory cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one of them. Now, expanding this a little bit more further, there is, however, a fine line between deliberate and unintended insults. After all, one person's insults can be another's form of dialogue. So it's not as simple as saying, don't insult or degrade each other. Now, rather than just allowing ourselves to be free to hate, curse and degrade, thereby not achieving the objectives of freedom of speech, the onus is for us to try and understand each other's sensitivities so that we can better convince, educate and express ourselves. You know, we've heard it all before. With freedom comes great responsibility. We have a responsibility to engage with each other in ways that are best. And this leads to another point. Intellectual dialogue is not threatened by being civil and being averse to insulting others. One can be intellectually robust and intellectually disagree while maintaining an intellectual tone. The Islamic tradition promotes this and its history is full of positive examples. Take, for example, the Quran itself concerning reason and argumentation. The associate professor, Rosalind Gwynn, she says in her book, Logic, Rhetoric and Legal Reasoning in the Quran, God's Arguments, reasoning and argument are so integral to the content of the Quran and so inseparable from its structure that they in many ways shape the very consciousness of Quranic scholars. So we need to realize that the values of Islam emanating from the Quran and the words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam paved the way to progress, truth and accountability while maintaining civility, good etiquette and upholding the best manners in dialogue and discussion. 
For instance, the Islamic values evoke the search for truth, as the Quran says in chapter 2, verse 42, and mix not truth with falsehood, nor conceal the truth while you know it. The Quran in chapter 103, verse 3 says, and enjoin on each other truth. Concerning accountability, Islam promotes and accounting the unjust ruler and preventing evil. The Prophet ﷺ said, The best of all struggles is a word of truth to a tyrant ruler. Similarly, the Quran echoes this type of value. In chapter 3, verse 104, the Quran says, Let there be among you people that command the good, and joining what is right and forbidding the wrong, they indeed are the successful. And God commands in the Quran his prophets, Moses and Harun, Aaron, upon whom be peace, to speak mildly to the oppressive and unjust Pharaoh while initially discussing with him. The Quran says in chapter 20, verse 44, and speak to him, Pharaoh, mildly, perhaps he may accept admonition. Now, what's interesting, the 13th century scholar, Imam Al-Qurtubi, he said concerning this verse, if Moses was commanded to commanded to speak mildly to Pharaoh, the unjust ruler, then it is even more appropriate for others to follow this command when speaking to others and when commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Similarly, Islamic values promote sincere debate, dialogue and discussion. The Quran says in chapter 49 verse 13, people, we created you from a single man and a single woman and made you into races and tribes so that you should know that you should get to know one another. In God's eyes, the most honored of you are the ones most mindful of him. God is all knowing, all aware. The Quran says in chapter 16, verse 125, invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good instruction and debate with him in a way that is best. Now, What's very important that the default position is that Islam does not allow the wanton insult of people's religious beliefs because it would lead the adherents of other religions to insult Allah, to insult God. Now, this default position, this value promotes social harmony. The Quran says in chapter 6, verse 108, All believers do not insult what they invoke besides God or they would insult God spitefully out of ignorance. Now, I do appreciate, just to be nuanced, there are other references in Islamic scripture that may seem to steer away from the, from the above. However, there are more variables, exegetical context, and other nuances when understood effectively reconcile any apparent contradiction. Now, this needs to be unpacked for another video, but the point here is what I've mentioned so far are the default key profound universal values in the Islamic tradition. The next point I want to make is, it is quite clear that the extremist, secular and liberal ideologues are preventing social harmony. So let's ask another question. Who has the right to draw the line and the way when it comes to restrictions on speech? Think about this. Now for me, and for Muslims, it can be answered by exploring the Islamic teachings, as we've just introduced, and the philosophical foundations of Islam. The philosophical foundations of Islam. Because Islam's intellectual foundations are true. And what they articulate are true, because whatever comes from truth is true. God exists. He is worthy of worship. His Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the final prophet, and his revelation, the Quran, is divine revelation. So what they say about dialogue and speech and cohesion are from the one who has the totality of wisdom and knowledge. God has the picture. We just have a pixel. So I invite every single one of you to explore the truth of Islam and its values by visiting our website, for example, and downloading our literature. Links will be provided below. Obviously, we can't unpack the philosophical foundations of Islam and to show that they're true, but I invite you to explore them because whatever comes from truth is true. I want to talk about now Islamic teachings, teachings as they were implemented in society and history because when you study history, you see that Islam was a beacon of light for Europe. You know, there was... Generally speaking, compared to what's happening now, there was no gratuitous degradation, but there was a social political atmosphere that intellectual progress was, was, was actually occurring and that there was a convivencia, coexistence, there was a harmony. And what's very interesting, it's these Islamic values that were implemented in society that French secular ideologues are benefiting from right now. And I'm going to explain this in a moment. Now, Civility led to the progress we enjoy today. And disregarding civility is taking us back to the dark ages. 
French ideologue politicians have a self-defeating attitude in some way. Think about it. Because the only reason they can use their mobile phone and their laptops to insult in this uncivilized manner is because of the Islamic civilization. It facilitated the develop development of the algorithm which is necessary for modern day computers. Now, when the Islamic values were implemented in the Muslim lands, progress was an inevitable outcome. For instance, the historian Robert Brufault in The Making of Humanity, he explains how progress was not only evident in Islamic history, but European growth was facilitated by the Islamic civilization. He says, For although there is not a single aspect of European growth in which the decisive influence of Islamic culture is not traceable, nowhere is it so clear and momentous as in the genesis of that power which constitutes the permanent distinctive force of the modern world and the supreme source of its victory, natural science and scientific spirit. Similarly, Professor Thomas Arnold in his book, The Preaching of Islam, he was of the opinion that the European Renaissance was rooted in Islamic Spain. He says, Muslim Spain had written one of the brightest pages in the history of medieval Europe. Her influence had passed through province into other countries of Europe, bringing to birth a new poetry and a new culture. And it was from her that Christian scholars received what of Greek philosophy and science they had to stimulate their mental activity up to the time of the Renaissance. Finally, brothers and sisters and friends, a final note to the Muslims. The liberal ideologues have a sub-mental adoration of absolute freedom. And this sub-mental adoration is illusory. And it's really a cry of their human souls yearning for Allah, yearning for God. Why? Because only Allah is absolutely free. Absolute freedom be a, being a part of his divinity. He is al ghani He is the rich, the free. He is as samad He is the self-subsisting. He is the self-sufficient. He is the independent. And we need to make them realize out of wisdom and compassion that they will never be satisfied unless they worship and adore the one that created them and the one that is worthy of worship. And it's our duty to share the message of Islam, defend the religion and defend the honor of the greatest man to have walked this earth, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I invite you all to become intellectual and academic activists to defend and convey Islam with wisdom, compassion and reason. Join and support Sapiens Institute that is dedicated in achieving this goal. And I'll end with the verses of the Quran, chapter 12, verse 108. Say, O Prophet, this is my way. I invite to God with insight, I and those who follow me. Glory be to God, and I am not, and I am not one of the polytheists. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته